Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture. Um, today, we are going to be talking about the cardiac and pulmonary systems. Um, so this is a bio biochem lecture today. My name is Megan, and I'm one of the lecturers here with Socratic Med, um, focusing mostly on bio biochem and psych -soch. Um, so this is our 15-week question-based learning course. So how this course runs basically is we'll have about 10 questions per lecture. Um, we'll ask the question first, and then we'll follow it up with um, covering all the topics that were, that were seen in that question. Um, so here I have linked our group me. Um, this is where we'll post the links to our lectures when they're uploaded, um, send slide decks, and also where you can ask any questions to the tutors about um, videos from this 15-week course or any other questions you might have um, in your MCAT studying. Um, I also have linked our Instagram here, our YouTube channel, which is where all, our, all of our videos can be found. Um, and yeah, our schedule is two lectures per week. So we'll have a Sunday lecture released at 8.30 p.m. Eastern and a Monday lecture also released at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, all right, so uh, definitely encourage you to join the group me if you're not already in it. Um, it's a great resource to have to be able to contact the tutors easily. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So question one, we're going to start talking about the heart. So which of the following arteries does not carry oxygenated blood? So take a minute here and pause the video and answer this question. Alrighty, assuming you've answered the question, I'll reveal the answer now, which is B, the pulmonary artery. So now we're going to go through and just cover the anatomy of the heart and you know which side pumps oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. Um, yeah, so everything else here, um, you can assume pumps oxygenated blood. Um, yeah. All right, so on the right here, I have a nice picture that outlines everything really well. Um, so we can see our pulmonary artery here. The answer to our question is blue. So blue usually means in pictures that it's deoxygenated. Um, yeah, so the atria are the waiting rooms. You can kind of think of them like that. Um, this is where the blood collects from veins before getting pumped into the ventricles. Um, so the ventricles are very muscular. You can see even in the picture here, they have a lot thicker of a wall and that's because they have to pump blood out of the heart to the rest of the body or to the lungs um, at really high pressures. So the right side of the heart is what receives deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation. Um, so our, our right atrium will collect that deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava. Um, and the right ventricle will then pump that deoxygenated blood out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs where it can become oxygenated. So the left side of the heart um, over here, you can see receives oxygenated blood and that will come from the pulmonary veins from the lungs. And the left ventricle, um, again, a lot more muscular than the atria, also a lot bigger. Um, this will pump oxygenated blood through the aorta to the tissue um, to go and deliver that oxygen. Um, one thing I do wanna point out is you might see how the right side um, is on your left. So when you're talking anatomically, um, right and left is about the patient that you're looking at, not, um, sorry. <laughs> not yourself. So that is just something to be aware of. Um, could get a little bit confusing. I just wanna let you guys know. All right, so now we're going to talk about the valves of the heart. So we have the tricuspid valve, which is an, so AV valves are atrioventricular um, because they're between the atria and the ventricles. So the tricuspid valve is one of our AV valves. Um, this is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. 
Um, the pulmonary semilunar valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. The mitral valve or the bicuspid valve um, is our other atrioventricular valve, and this is on the left side. So this is between the left atrium and left ventricle. Um, and the aortic semilunar valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. So these valves basically um, will prevent backflow of blood in the heart. Um, blood flow is unidirectional, so it cannot flow backwards. Um, and the pressure inside the atria or ventricles will prevent that blood from flowing backwards. It'll slam those valves shut so it can't flow in the wrong direction. All right, now we have question two, another question about the heart. Which of the following is true during systole? Um, take a minute here and pause the video and answer this question. All right, assuming that you've answered the question now, I will show the answer. The answer here is B, pressure in the atria is low, allowing them to fill with blood from the vena cava and pulmonary veins. Um, so we're going to talk now a little bit about what systole is. Systole is the contraction of the ventricles. So while those are contracting, um, pressure in the atria is low and that blood can passively flow into the atria and be ready to be pumped into the ventricles. Um, so this can be called the cardiac cycle. So we have diastole and systole, um, and we'll talk about these. You might recognize these words in terms of blood pressure, diastolic and systolic blood pressure. Um, so we'll talk about these words in that context a little bit later today, um, but for now we're just going to be focusing on what it means in the heart. Um, so basically the right and left sides of the heart are going through this same cardiac cycle at the same time. Um, and the pumping of the heart can be split into diastole and systole. So diastole is when the ventricles are relaxed and the blood is flowing in from the atria. Um, and at the end of diastole, this is when the ventricles will contract. And that's how we know that systole is beginning. Um, so the contraction of the ventricles will slam the atrioventricular valve shut um, preventing that backflow and will, uh, that will allow the blood to flow unidirectionally out of the heart, um, either through the aorta or the pulmonary artery. All right, so the heart sound, um, believe it or not, is actually called lubbed up um, because that's what it sounds like. So the lub is the sound caused by the closure of the atrial ventricular valves at the beginning of systole. So when the ventricle, the ventricles are contracting and those valves slam shut, the lub sound, that first heart sound, is caused by those valves closing. Um, and then the dup sound is the sem semilunar valves closing at the end of systole. So the aortic semilunar valve and the pulmonary valve, um, those will close at the end of systole. So yeah, those are the sounds that you will hear um, listening to somebody's heart. And it usually sounds like lubbed up and any abnormalities to that sound um, is usually indicative of some kind of murmur or some other heart problem. So heart rate, cardiac output and stroke volume, these are a few terms that you should definitely be familiar with. Um, so heart rate um, is just your pulse. So that's the number of beats per minute. Um, normal pulse rates range from about 45 to 80 beats per minute. Um, that would be resting, obviously not with exercise. You can expect that to go up significantly. Um, a, so a stronger heart pumps blood more efficiently. So it pumps more blood with each contraction. So people with lower heart rates, you can expect in like athletes or runners or people that are, are in really good cardiovascular health um, and a higher resting heart rate then would indicate the opposite, which would be a weaker heart um, and can be expected in children or the elderly. Um, so stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped with each systole and cardiac output is the total amount of blood pumped per minute. Um, so as you can probably expect, the equation here, um, cardiac output equals the stroke volume times your heart rate. 
Um, yeah, so I would definitely be familiar with all of these terms and what they mean. Um, yeah, so let's. So um, it's important to note that cardiac muscle is di uh, different from both smooth and skeletal muscle. Um, it acts as a functional syncytium, which basically means that the cytoplasm between all of the cardiac muscle cells are connected um, and they're connected and are able to communicate very easily with each other through gap junctions. Um, and those gap junctions you can see here are present at the intercalated discs, which are just the connections between cardiac muscle cells. Um, so this allows the depolarization to travel directly from cell to cell, which is why our heart can beat um, so rhythmically and all together. And it's not like a slow wave of depolarizations passing down through from cell to cell. It all happens very quickly through these gap junctions. Um, so for the heart becoming excited and how it um, contracts, obviously we don't have a neuronal or hormonal input every like once a second um, that gives us that contraction. Um, so the heart contracts auto automatically, um, it does on its own and it's very rhythmic. So contraction is initiated in the sinoatrial node or the SA node, which is known as the pacemaker of the heart. Um, so this will fire an action potential very rhythmically um, due to the um, leak sodium channels, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so yeah, basically it doesn't have a stable resting potential. That resting potential is always, it's very slightly increasing and that will allow these cells to reach threshold and fire that potential um, automatically and rhythmically. Um, so the atrioventricular node or the AV node is what transmits the electrical signal from the atria to the ventricles. Um, and this kind of coordinates how those contract um, rhythmically and allow optimal coordination between these contractions, um, allowing the blood to flow throughout the body. Um, so the SA node action potential can be divided into phase zero, phase three, and phase four, um, while other cardiac myocytes are divided into phases zero through four. Um, so we'll go through all those phases after the next question. Um, so question three, we're gonna still on the heart. Um, which phase of cardiac excitation is characterized by inactivation of sodium channels and opening of potassium channels? So take a minute here, um, pause the video and answer the question. Alrighty, assuming that you have answered this question, I'm going to show the answer here, which is A, phase one. So we're gonna just go through and characterize all of these phases, um, you know, what channels are opening and what stage of contraction um, the heart will be in. All right, so first we're gonna talk about um, these phases in the cardiac myocytes. And then at the end, we're gonna go over um, these phases in the SA node. Um, so they look a little bit different. So this will be phase zero through four, whereas the SA node is phases zero, three, and four. Um, yeah, so phase zero, you can see the graph on the right. That is going to be our big depolarization. Um, so this is basically when the myocyte reaches threshold, we will open voltage-gated sodium channels and sodium will rush into the cell. Um, phase one, you can see is this short little initial repolarization. Um, so at a certain um, voltage, these sodium channels will inactivate and potassium channels will open. Um, so that's why we have this just initial little drop in um, in voltage here. And yeah, this was the answer to our question because this is where those sodium channels will initially inactivate. Um, so the calcium channels will also begin to open here due to the rapid influx of sodium, but they're a little bit slower opening. So they're more relevant for phase two. Um, and phase two here is the plateau phase. So this is where the influx of calcium um, from those voltage-gated voltage calcium channels will balance the 
efflux of potassium um, from those channels that opened up in phase one. So that will cause this plateau phase because we have um, some positive coming in and some positive going out. So there's not too much of a net change in voltage for the cells at this phase. Um, so phase three, this is our repolarization that you can see on this graph here. Um, this is where those calcium channels will close, so we won't have calcium coming in anymore, but the potassium channels will stay open. So that potassium is still rushing out of the cell and making it more negative. Um, phase four, this is where we'll restore our resting membrane potential. Um, this is where inward and outward currents are equal, and this is dictated largely by the sodium potassium ATPase, um, as well as slow potassium leak channels. All right, so now the SA node, this is our pacemaker. So you can see here already in stage four how we have that unstable resting potential. Um, so this is how these cells can fire automatically without any outside depolarization event um, occurring. These will just go through the cycle um, over and over. Um, so we're gonna start again with phase zero here, which is our depolarization, just like it was in the cardiac myocytes. Um, however, here, this is caused by opening of calcium channels, uh, not sodium channels. So these calcium channels will open when the membrane reaches threshold, um, just like you can see on the graph. Um, and reaching threshold is made possible by those sodium leak channels that cause that unstable resting potential. Um, so it will go depolarize up towards the calcium equilibrium potential, um, and then we'll move on to phase three. This is where our calcium channels will close and potassium channels will open and allow potassium to flow out of the cell, um, causing that repolarization event. And then phase four, this is the automatic slow repolarization, um, which is our unstable resting potential. So this is where those sodium leak channels are open and will allow um, sodium to leak into the cell and cause it to slowly go up towards that threshold. Um, so once it reaches threshold, we'll get that action potential firing again and we will start over with phase zero and we'll have this rhythmic contraction. All right, question four, we're gonna talk a little bit about blood pressure. Which of the following has the lowest pressure during the cardiac cycle? All right, so take a minute here, pause the video and answer the question. Alrighty, assuming you've answered the question, I'll show the answer now, which is going to be D, the vena cava. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about blood pressure in general. Um, and for this question, mainly the only thing that you need to know is that the lowest pressure um, at anywhere in the cardiac system usually is the vena cava. It's about zero millimeters of mercury. Um, that's because that's where that blood is passively flowing in to the right atrium, uh, especially that superior vena cava. All right, so blood pressure, something I'm sure we're all familiar hearing um, these numbers. You might not know what they mean yet, so we're going to just go over them um, so that's nice and clear. So st systolic blood pressure, that is our upper number in your blood pressure. So this is where we will have the highest arterial pressure at any point um, in this individual circulatory system. Obviously, only during blood pressure reading, you don't know if, I guess, if it changed like an hour later or something. But um, so, yeah, the units of this is millimeters mercury. Um, and this is attained as the ventricles contract. Um, so this is during systole, which is why it's systolic blood pressure. So the diastolic blood pressure is the lowest arterial pressure at any point in this individual circulatory system during the blood pressure reading. Um, so this is the pressure in those arteries during diastole. So this will be between heartbeats. Um, and that's basically when the heart's not pumping. Um, yeah, so that's what these two numbers mean. Um, and I, I italicize arterial because um, the vena cava is a vein, not an artery. So that's why that is where the lowest um, pressure in the body is. 
Um, so blood pressure can be regulated a few ways. Um, so there's local autoregulation in the tissues. So um, tissues, when they need extra blood flow and they're not getting enough oxygen, um, they will start to produce these waste products. And when those start to build up, um, we will get an automatic vasodilation, which will allow greater blood flow to those tissues. Um, and then we also have baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors that are located in the aortic arch. Um, these also regulate blood pressure. Um, so basically, if there's increased pressure in the aortic arch, that's telling the baroreceptors that blood pressure is high, and that will cause them to increase their firing and di dilate the arteries more to lower the blood pressure. All right, question five, we're going to move on a little bit and talk about blood. The hormone erythropoietin is made in the blank and stimulates red blood cell production in the blank. All right, so this is a kind of a two by two. So if you know one of the two answers, you can eliminate half of your choices. Um, yeah, so try to use that strategy if possible. Um, otherwise, yeah, take a minute, pause the video and answer this question. All right, assuming you've answered the question here, I will, will reveal the answer, which is A. So it is made in the kidney and stimulates um, red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Um, so this is kind of just a knowledge-based question, um, not too much strategy here, but we'll just talk a little bit about blood, erythrocytes, erythropoietin, and all that good stuff. So the components of blood, we have plasma, which is the liquid component. Um, there's the buffy coat, which is our leukocytes and platelets, and the formed elements, which are the cellular components. This is where our red blood cells will be. Um, so for the liquid component, um, plasma, this accounts for about 55% of blood volume, um, and it's a mixture of electrolytes, buffers, sugars, blood proteins, lipoproteins, carbon dioxide, oxygen, metabolic waste products, um, all of those dissolved in water. Um, and the buffers in that will maintain blood at a pH of around 7.4. Um, the main buffer there is uh, HCO3. Um, so talk a little bit about some of the important components and proteins in blood. So albumin, this is a blood protein that is necessary in maintaining oncotic pressure in the capillaries. Um, immunoglobulins are a key component in the immune system. Fibrinogen is involved, important in blood clotting. Um, lipoproteins are there to transport lipids in the bloodstream. Um, and then hematocrit um, is not really a thing, it's more a term, but it basically says the volume of blood that's occupied by red blood cells. So a normal hematocrit value for men would be 40 to 45%, um, and for women will be 35 to 40%. So being below these values, you might be considered anemic. Um, also would usually look at your hemoglobin in that case. Um, but yeah, all right, so... These are our red blood cells on the right here, our erythrocytes. So the hormone erythropoietin is made in the kidney and stimulates red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Um, the purpose of red blood cells is to transport inhaled oxygen to tissues and then transport um, carbon dioxide from tissues to the lungs to be exhaled. Um, red blood cells have a lifespan of about 120 days, um, and when they reach that, the end of their lifespan, they're eaten by phagocytes in the spleen and liver, um, so they can be digested. Um, so these are technically cells, but they don't have like a nucleus or mitochondria like our normal cells, um, but they do use ATP um, to pump ions and maintain their structural integrity. And the shape that they have, that's kind of like a deflated ball donut type shape um, is so that they have a higher surface area to volume ratio. Um, so they can have a ton of hemoglobin on there, which is what actually will carry our oxygen um, to the tissues. Um, so blood typing, um, 
this refers to um, what alleles you have that's making your um, blood. So basically we have an ABO blood typing and an RH blood typing. Usually what we think of is a combination of the two. So the ABO blood group basically consists of glycoproteins coded by three alleles. So it's either AI, AB, or IA, IB, um, and lowercase i. So that lowercase i will be recessive, um, as you know, with how we do genotyping. Um, and then A and B are actually codominant. So that's how we have that AB blood type. Um, so RH blood typing involves the RH factor. Um, so someone can either be RR, uh, cap two capital R's or capital R lowercase r. Um, that will have them express the RH factor and their blood will be RH positive. Um, whereas if they have two recessive alleles for this, they will not express it and they'll be RH negative. Um, so I have a few examples on here just so you can be a little bit more comfortable with this. So someone with um, amino or gly glycoprotein A, um, and then that lowercase i, and a capital R lowercase r genotype would have A positive blood. Um, that's because that lowercase i um, doesn't really do anything here because it's recessive. Um, and then if someone had IA, IB, and lowercase r, lowercase r, they would have AB negative blood. Um, so if someone had two lowercase i's, then that would be O blood. Um, that's one that should have included in the examples, but now you know. All right, so question six, we're gonna talk briefly about the lymphatic system. Which of the following is not directly aided by the lymphatic system? So just take a minute here, um, pause the video and answer this question. All right, assuming you've answered the question, I'm going to play the video or show the answer, sorry. Um, so the answer here is D, the endocrine system. Um, and that's because hormones travel through the bloodstream, not through your lymphatic system. Um, however, these other three, so the cardiovascular system, immune system, and digestive system, all um, are aided uh, and involved directly with the lymphatic system. So we'll just go over that really quickly on this next slide. Um, so lymphatic system consists of tiny lymphatic capillaries that are present um, in all tissues throughout the body. So the fluid in these vessels is called lymph. Um, and our lymph nodes will filter this fluid throughout the body. Um, so you can see already how this plays a huge role in the immune system. Um, also, if you've ever been sick and you've noticed you have swollen lymph nodes, like in your neck, um, that's because they're trying to filter out those pathogens and fight them off for your body. So yeah, for the immune system, the lymphatic system also makes and releases white blood cells um, and other immune cells that monitor and destroy um, invaders or pathogens. Um, the cardiovascular system is aided by the lymphatic system in that uh, the lymphatic system will drain excess fluid from tissues and return it to the bloodstream to avoid um, tissue swelling or tissue damage. Um, the digestive system, um, the lymphatic system will absorb fat and fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins and transport those um, to ve uh, venous circulation. So yeah, pretty straightforward. I'm not super in depth here, but just wanted to touch on that briefly so you are familiar with some of the roles of the lymphatic system. All right, question seven. Now we're gonna move on to the respiratory system. Um, gas exchange incurs in the blank of the lungs. So take a minute here, pause the video and answer the question. Alrighty, I'm going to reveal our answer now, which is C, alveoli. Um, so we're going to go through now and cover all these structures of the lungs um, and what occurs at each stage. Um, so the anatomy of the respiratory system, this is basically the pathway of air um, as it will travel through your respiratory system. So it will start in the nose, pass through the navel cavity, down to the pharynx, um, down through the larynx, 
down through the trachea into the bronchi, um, down to terminal bronchioles, and then respiratory bronchioles, um, and then alveolar ducts, and then finally to the alveoli. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about all these structures, don't worry. Um, so the purpose of the nose is to warm, humidify, and filter inhaled air. So the hairs that you have in your nose and the mucus is there to trap um, inhaled particles so they don't go all the way down into your lungs. Um, so the navel cavity is just an open space that the air will pass through. Um, the pharynx, that'll be your throat. The larynx is what will keep the airway open. Um, this also contains the epiglottis, which will close um, and seal the trachea during swallowing to prevent food from going into your lungs. Um, and then the vocal cords are also here and they vibrate to produce sound so we can speak. Um, so the trachea is our next step. This contains cartilage rings that allow it to stay open and rigid and allow air to flow freely through there. Um, can't collapse on itself because of that strong cartilage. Um, so the bronchi, we have one left and one right primary bronchi. This is where we'll branch into the right and left lung. Um, and yeah, the air will pass through there and supply uh, the lungs with air. So the bronchioles, these are just small branches of the bronchi. Uh, these don't have cartilage. Um, this is as we're getting really small in the lungs. And then the alveoli, these are at the end. Um, this is a big site of gas exchange. Um, so respiratory epithelium. So from the nose down to the bronchioles, the respiratory epithelium is uh, columnar epithelial cells. Um, so in these, you have some goblet cells, which are specialized to secrete mucus. Um, and then all of the respiratory epithelium, these columnar cells will have cilia on their surface. So these will sweep mucus um, towards the pharynx to either be swallowed or coughed out. So any inhaled particles won't pass all the way down into your lungs. Um, they'll get stuck in that mucus and swept away by the cilia. Um, so terminal bronchioles and alveoli are simple squamous epithelial cells. So they're thin, flat cells, um, and this allows oxygen and carbon dioxide to freely pass through. Um, columnar cells, especially with mucus, would be too thick and would not facilitate gas exchange and would not allow that oxygen um, and carbon dioxide to pass through. Um, so since there's no protective mucus here, there are alveolar macrophages, which will engulf any foreign particles that did make it all the way down to this level. Um, so our type 1 alveolar cells will facilitate gas exchange, whereas type 2 alveolar cells secrete something called surfactant, which will um, prevent the alveoli from collapsing under surface tension, because these are really, really tiny and really, really thin, um, but they need to stay open. Um, like a little ball. So this surfactant prevents them from collapsing down on themselves. All right, question eight. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the respiratory system. So in mammals, which of the following are involved in inhalation? So um, again, I've talked about this before, but just in case you're new with our Roman numeral questions, I encourage you to find a number that appears in exactly two answers. And if you know if that's definitely right or definitely wrong, then that allows you to erase half of your answers immediately. Um, and sometimes you won't even need to um, look at all the Roman numerals, especially for questions that have four of them. Um, this is a really helpful strategy to narrow down your answers a little bit. All right, so. I will reveal our answer now, which is C, one and three. So it's the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm that are involved in inhalation. So we will cover what that means now. So inhalation, this is an active process. So the diaphragm contracts downwards, um, which will open the chest cavity more and allow air to flow in. Um, and then the external intercostal muscles will expand the chest cavity outwards, um, again, making that chest cavity larger and allowing for the inflow of air. 
Um, exhalation, on the other hand, is passive. So this is simply the relaxation of the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. Um, so when all of these muscles relax, the size of the chest cavity will get smaller um, and that will force the air that is in those lungs out. Um, and it will just push it out. All right, one more question about the respiratory system. In a person with reduced lung elasticity, which of the following will occur? So take a minute here and pause the video and answer your question. All right, assuming you've answered the question, I'm going to reveal our answer here, which is B, residual volume will increase. Um, so I'm going to talk about what um, all of these mean, like total lung capacity, residual volume, um, and all those things. Um, so the reason C is incorrect, because we just talked about expiration, um, that's usually passive. With someone with reduced elasticity, um, the lungs will not want to recoil and push that air out because they'll want to stay expanded because they're not elastic enough to do that. So that person will need to kind of forcefully um, push that air out and it won't just happen passively as it would in a normal person. All right, so here are a bunch of terms. Um, this is not super high yield, but I think it's good to be familiar with these terms um, and just some of the differences. Um, they're all pretty self-explanatory in the name, but I still just want to cover them so you all are exposed to these terms. Um, so tidal volume, this is the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs with a normal breath. So you're not taking deep breaths at the doctor, you're not working out, you're just breathing, resting normally. Um, and this is usually about 10% of the total volume of the lungs. Um, so expiratory reserve volume, this is the volume of air that can be expired after a passive expiration. So again, you're just breathing normally. You're not trying to breathe out really hard. You're not breathing in really hard. Um, when you passively breathe out, um, you can force more air out if you try. Um, you can try right now if you want, but that amount of air is the expiratory reserve volume. Um, so the inspiratory reserve volume, again, this is just after a relaxed uh, resting inspiration. Um, you can take more air in if you want to. Um, so the volume of air that that is, is the inspiratory reserve volume. Um, the functional residual capacity, this is the volume of air that's left in the lungs after a relaxed expiration. Um, so when you're breathing in and out normally, you're not pushing all of that air out of the lungs. Um, there's some residual air in there that, as you can see from expiratory reserve volume, you can force that air out if you want to. Um, so inspiratory capacity, this is the maximum volume that can be inhaled after a resting expiration. So not a forced expiration. So this isn't total lung capacity or anything. So a relaxed expiration, um, and then maximum inhalation, that is the inspiratory capacity. Um, residual volume is the amount of air that is in the lungs after a forceful, strong exhalation. So even if you do force all that air out, there will still be air in your lungs. You can't get all of it out. And that is our residual volume. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be forced out of the lungs after a very deep, forceful, inhalation. So now you're taking the deepest breath in that you can and letting out the most air that you possibly can. That is your vital capacity. Um, total lung capacity, this is calculated by adding vital capacity and residual volume. All right, question 10. Now we're going to review one of the topics that we've covered today. Um, try to force yourself to do some recall. Again, I think recall is a great tool in studying. Um, helped me so much for my MCAT. Um, so any chance that you get, I would encourage you to try and get yourself to recall information, even if it's just five, 10 minutes after you learn something, just seeing a word and then trying to recall all the information that you just learned about that word. Um, it's a really helpful way to study and a great way to kind of solidify that information. 
So which valve prevents the backflow of blood from the right ventricle into the right atrium? Let's take a minute here, um, pause the video, try not to look at your notes um, and answer this question. All right, um, assuming that you have answered the question, I will reveal our answer which is B, the tricuspid valve. So the tricuspid valve is the one that is between the right ventricle and right atrium, um, whereas our mitral valve is between the left ventricle and left atrium. Um, yeah, so this was just pretty much straight recall question, not too much strategy in there. Um, yeah, hopefully you all got that right. If not, then you know, go back and review all of that stuff about heart structure. Um, well, thank you guys for coming to today's lecture. Um, there are a ton of resources available through Socratic Med. I encourage you to check out um, some of the other videos as well from this course, uh, the question-based learning course, or any of our other courses that we have. Um, any topics that you're struggling with, I'm sure that we have a video somewhere out there on it. And if not, then feel free again to ask any questions you have in the group me and our tutors will be more than happy to help you out. Um, so good luck studying for the MCAT. Um, and next week, I know we'll have a couple more videos released. Um, so again, join that group me and watch out for those, um, for those links to be posted in there. Uh, thanks again and good luck.